Then, without further ado, I wanted to introduce Anne, Anne Lin Chang. She is um, a professor of English at Princeton, as well as the director of American Studies. And recently I found out she's a Libra. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an Aquarius, just so you know, so I'm glad I'm air going on right now today. Mm -hmm. um, so, I guess we would shoot. No, the Libra thing, that means I'm either, most people are, you know, well balanced. I, I'm, a, I'm the kind of Libra who's big, big tip, just so you know. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to try and make this talk happen to, as if um, it's targeted to the person who's not necessarily actually in red orientalism or ornamentalism. Um, so I guess we can start off with maybe a brief summary of how you arrived at the theory and, um, Let's just pretend that we did not read your bed, you read your book every night in bed, like with a flashlight. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, thank you. I would just first want to thank everyone for being here. I know it's probably going to get really hot here really soon, so I really appreciate your support. Um, and um, thanks, Daniel, of course, for this great opportunity to not only think through some of the issues with the amazing artists who are on the exhibit at this gallery. Thank Alex for making it possible. Um, I have to say I have been incredibly inspired. I, I came in um, a few months earlier to meet with some of the artists who were um, in, you know, in Brooklyn, more local, and um, it was just really, I was just really inspired. It was just really inspiring, you know, because I don't think I would have had the kind of courage that they have when I was at, at their age, and um, the, the the sort of sacrifices that they make in order to be a working artist today. I'm just, it was just really inspiring. So. I just want to first begin with a shout out to the artists who are in this exhibit, and if we could just all give them a hand, that would be <laughs> So, ornamentalism, I have to first say that I did not make up this word. Um, it's been around since the 1900s, used usually by art historians to talk about the state of ornamentation, of being ornamented, and usually excessively ornamented. Um, it's, a, it's a negative thing. Um, but I have always thought it was so weird that nobody, I mean, people, of course, have written about ornamentalism, but no one has ever written about what I seem to me so glaring or so loud in the word, which is this almost homilific echo of orientalism. And, and then as I started doing some thinking and looking around and researching, I realized that it's not just my own idiosyncratic <laughs> you know, tendency to hear Orientalism in various things, but because actually, in fact, there's been a really long uh, philosophic and aesthetic connection or confusion between the Oriental and the ornamental. I'm talking as old as Plato all the way through the 19th century with um, Wiesmann or Oscar Wilde, um, and then you know, in the 16th century with Marco Polo, but all the way up until today, right? And so. Um, it's when I first started thinking about this connection and often confusion between oriental persons and usually women and ornamental thingliness that I thought, oh, there's something here that is really um, powerful for me to thinking about the relationship between Asiatic femininity and, um, and objectness. And I have to say that we all, I'm sure especially in a room like this, we all know about the objectification of women and the objectification of Asian women in particular, um, and it's you no, know, it's a long that's just, that's an equally long history. Um, but I think what I wanted to do through this project was to think really hard and differently about what that what the condition of objects means, because I think um, I think we all know the problem with Orientalism and Orientalist stereotypes. But part of the problem with knowing so much about the stereotype is that it actually stops you from thinking about it. Right? Most people, and myself included for many years, but whenever I see a kind of orientalist image, I just kind of cringe inside, you know? And I just, I turn away. And I think a lot of people do that, and then they dismiss it as, you know, something bad, which it is. But I think by labeling something a stereotype in a very sort of categorical and complacent way, or moralistic way, it actually prevents us from seeing what's going on in that relationship. Um, and it actually prevents us from seeing the different kinds of possibilities that might um, 
have been produced, not in a redemptive way, but just because um, in, in modes of survival. You know, I, you know if, you have, if you are someone who has been culturally, you know, if not personally, certainly culturally objectified, um, it produces a certain kind of personness. Um, and that, but you could still continue to try to survive. And so part of what I'm really interested in with this book is to think much harder about a relationship between personness and thingness, and to also give us a way of rethinking, um, or perhaps really rethinking what are the terms of what we consider to be human in the first place. Um, and so, so at first the word ornamentalism, which is a combination of orientalism and ornament, um, for me, is a way of naming that historic relationship of conflation between persons and things. But I'm hoping that the, the word or the term do the work of so much more than just naming something we probably already all know, but rather to use it as a critical lens to think about the really difficult processes through which things are made into persons and persons into things, especially around through the, uh, the, uh, the medium of Asiatic femininity. So that's sort of like the background of the book. Um, and that's how I came to this book. I mean, so I have to tell you, I think it is the most inelegant word in the world, ornamentalism. It's so awkward. Um, and it's particularly weird because he actually names what seemed to me a very elegant uh, and complicated and, and smooth alchemy of this transition between persons and things. Um, the process is actually almost always um, naturalized so that you don't even think anything about it. Um, so it's actually a very, elegant and uncanny and spooky um, process and dynamic uh, that is uh, that I think the word ornamentalism names but is actually doesn't actually do justice to it because the word itself is so is so awkward a word mm -hmm. and I wanted to talk about how you arrived at this theory by centering the <coughs> yellow woman which if I were to be honest brought me immense relief um, at having been finally addressed but also a lot of anxiety because, as we know with Asian American studies, I mean, it often excludes black studies, and the word woman is also being um, disputed right now, you know, what it, it's cisgender and all these things, and you have this um, demand in pop culture for like more accurate or authentic representations as like an anecdote to our frustration at erasure. So, I mean, did you, in cross, those kinds of like critiques and how did you manage that? Well, I have to say, even saying the phrase yellow woman took a lot of therapy on my part, <laughs> um, <laughs> both with my therapist, but also uh, intellectually, like a lot of sort of self um, confrontation around issues that I have found either troubling or problematic that I have not really wanted to take on or be afraid to take on in certain ways. Um, and so I use the word yellow woman almost as a kind of a fight song <laughs> for, for myself. Um, I don't use it to um, authenticate a notion of an Asian woman. I, don't, I do not use it to redeem it as a kind of, you know, the way people have redeemed queerness, for example. Um, but I use it in particular with, its, with the pain of the phrase, with all intention, because what I want to do is name that racialization, which I think is often unnoted, and it links to another sort of, there's a lot of strands behind this project, but the other strand is, sort of my own relationship to um, feminist theory. As, as a comparative race scholars working in Asian American literature and African American literature, I am very familiar with the incredibly like, productive, um, copious, and profound theory around black, black femininity, black feminist theorists. Um, and, but I have always felt that as generative and as powerful, as that body of work has been, they never seem to quite get at some of the issues that I worry about, think about around Asiatic femininity. And, and I couldn't quite put my finger on why, because um, it's not satisfying to me just to say, well, they're two different races or something like that, just kind of silly. But on the other hand, what I realized is that it's not that they're different races, it's, it's that there are different processes of racialization behind black femininity and Asiatic femininity. And the differences of those racialization is actually what's not accounted for right, in these kind of in the in the theoretical gap that I'm perceiving. And so, to put it in a very sort of reductive way, um, 
I'm not going to say more about this um, for those of you who do not want to fall asleep right now, later, I can talk more about this, but um, I think that black feminist theory has been incredibly, particularly productive in thinking about black female flesh and fleshliness. Um, and um, we can understand why that's the case, right? And so someone like Hortense Spillers, who is a very significant figure in the field, you know, for, there's, there's, for, I think in all of the work, there's a kind of um, profound longing and nostalgia around the injured black thing of flesh. And th but that's exactly the sticking point for me when it comes to Asiatic femininity is because one of the things I started thinking about is how Asian fe Asiatic femininity, in spite of all the eroticization and language of you know sex around it, is a curiously like non fleshly. It is built around the, the racialization of Asiatic femininity is curiously synthetic. Right? It's about whether it's about things like silk or porcelain or you know, skin like porcelain or whatever. Um, ornaments, um, there's actually, um, you know, so you start, I started thinking about, well, what does it mean to think about feminist theory that's not based on the flesh? It doesn't deny the flesh, but doesn't, it's not based on that, but comes from a different way, from a different sort of fundamental mode of thinking. Um, and so this is, like, again, it takes us back to ornamentalism. This is why I started thinking about ornamentalism as particularly a feminist theory for, the, for and of the yellow woman, even though, yeah. as I try to do at the end of the book, um, particularly, um, I have a chapter on um, Toni Morrison that I tried to sort of say, um, try, I actually say that in fact, um, ornamentalism is a very powerful way of thinking about the specificity of Asiatic femininity, but it is not only, it does not only apply to Asiatic femininity, right? Because these processes of racialization are, um, are, are always a kind of stylization and aesthetic practice. And as such, they can be incorporated and appropriated, and you know. Um, so I actually think ornamentalism, as a way of thinking about racialization and generationalized gender, as not being based on flesh, might be as it could also be a powerful way to think about black femininity. So that's why I yeah. So I, I always think it's important to think about race and racialization comparatively because they just don't exist in vacuum. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, it was hard to say the yellow. I mean, even now, I, it's hard for me to say it. It's hard to write about it. Um, but I wanted to name it for what it is. The other thing is, to tell the truth, I wanted the ugliness of the phrase to really still ring because so much of the discourse around the Asiatic femininity is that it denies ugliness, right? It's all about supposedly about beauty, um, exoticization, um, and no one wants to talk about really the ugliness of that exoticization or the ugliness of, um, of beauty. Yeah. So, and can we go back to your um, the notion of authenticity versus inauthenticity? Because I really like this phrase um, you said once, where you were talking about your research with Josephine Baker and how it's actually disrespectful to have claimed to know the real Josephine Baker. And I just thought that was so beautiful because. Again, there's this huge demand for like more authentic, more accurate representations as um, this anecdote to erasure. And you also write about Anna Mae Wong in that way, that she was highly curated, she's a highly fabricated figure. And I think that's true for a lot of artists as well, like we decide how we appear to others as well. Um, and can you explain your choice to focus <coughs> on that rather than say like a biography of Anna Mae Wong? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, there, there are lots of biographies that anybody wants, and there's even more biographies of Joseph B. Baker out there, um, so I certainly don't need to write one. Um, but, so, I, so my point is not that their, life, that their real lives were not important, um, but that um, what I think is, so I think, so that you, I got you start with the authenticity problem. How many of you have heard about the Maxine Hong Kingston and Frank Chin debate from the 80s? I think some of you have. So, so basically, one of the things that happened around the start of Asian American literature was almost, I think almost the minute Asian American literature came into being, it was contested right away. Right? Um, so you know, I, you know, if, um, I mean, there's people like, like Jay Snow Wong, but, but Maxine Hong Kingston and The Woman Warrior, I would say is probably one of the, or most people think of when they think about the beginning of Asian American literary canon as such. Um, but there was this very famous um, by, um, um, collection of, of um, um, was it was it 
how was the was the IE uh, anthology? It was an anthology, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, but in the anthology of Asian American literature that came out, edited by um, Frank Chin and um, Sean Wan and, and, and another person that I can't recall. Um, there was a, a scandal erupted because Maxine Hong Kingston was not included and because Frank Chin says in the introdu introduction that she's not really an Asian American writer because she, um, because the stories in, the, in her novel are not true, like the myth, you know, the, the, her version of the Mormon warrior was not accurate um, and, and so forth. And, and then she wrote a reply and sparked this whole debate um, around what's cultural authenticity. Um, so I think the thing about authenticity is that it's an important concept. It's something that it's, but it's a, it's a myth. It's an important myth. We all have it. We all have to have, like you have to have a myth about your own authenticity, right? It, you have to have believe in it because otherwise you're some like, imagine yourself as a Bacchian character. You really cannot live like that, you know? So you need the, you need authenticity as a kind of dominant fiction of your life. But authenticity is in itself, in fact, a, a very like, non-existent in church, especially for you know, Asian American subject who are in the diaspora. Um, we all have very different relationship. Our, our own authentic relation to Asian American is, I bet for every single person in this room are different, right? Um, and so authenticity is, I, I don't want to knock it because I think it's an important concept, but I also think it's a very limited concept. And it's been used um, to, to discipline people, to exclude people, to coerce people. So it, it was a useful concept with a lot of problems. Um, and so, um, and to me, the problem with authenticity is linked to the problem of stereotypes. Because everyone always thinks that the answer to a stereotype is an authentic anti-stereotype, right? But that's actually just another stereotype. So, so what has always troubled me and I, th I find very uh, important to negotiate all the time is the continuum, not the separation, but the continuum between negative stereotype and a positive type. Right? And they're not opposite of each other. Um, but if you think about them as opposite, then you will forever be caught in the stereotype tra trap. Right? So you know, instead of saying Asian Americans are what, not smart, oh, or no, I'm sorry, they, they're, so they, people say that they're um, inscrutable. Do we want to come back and say, well, they're really warm? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, um, although that reminds me of that a little bit, but that, I, I think it's audience will appreciate. But there was recently a very important psychology test about Asian Americans, perceptions of Asians and Asian Americans in, in, in America, um, done by a very famous um, psychologist called Susan Fisk. And she asked, so there's two vectors. They asked people um, whether or not they thought Asian people were um, um, smart or, or high achieving and whether or not they thought they were warm or cool, that is likable or not. And the answer is exactly what you expect. A lot of people say they go high on the smart questions and low on the likability, right? And in a way, that the, the, and it was a big uproar about this. Um, and part of me just thought, well, I, I, I actually didn't need this elaborate research part <laughs> to tell me that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, also, number two, no one's asked, well, why are those the two vectors? Why are those two questions being asked in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's, um, so my point about this little excursion is that even questions in, invented to investigate stereotype reiterate those stereotypes. And so the trap um, of the stereotype is ongoing, and it will continue to go if we keep thinking our answer to a stereotype just by denying its authenticity. So that, again, this is just all my way of saying that I think authenticity is um, a highly problematic concept. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to the people I write about, historic figures, um, famous you know, women of color who became famous in spite of all the racism in their world, Josephine Baker, Anna May Wong, um, I feel like there is really um, only thing I, what I can say about them and what they have left to talk to us is the legacy of their work, not their personal life, right? And both Anna Mae Wong, especially Josephine Baker, but both of them were very self-consciously self-crafting people. They were very private. Almost, I mean, Josephine Baker, half of her house was a museum while she was living in it. This is in France, you know. Um, so, you know, she has 
the aromas of herself <laughs> that people can look at. I mean, these are people who are, I mean, this is like pre-Madonna, I mean, pre-Madonna type of mm -hmm. expertise around self-representation, right? These women really know how to craft their image, uh, and they were constantly doing so. And I feel like to, for me to sort of like pretend I can write about who they really are is not only disingenuous, but also not that productive. Um, so that's why I say that I'm not writing the autobiographies. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not writing biographies of Baker or Anna Wang. Um, and I think it's a, um, also, I think it's important to recognize the erasure of them as people. Like, even as they are so um, publicized and spectacularized as figures in the public and in culture, in, you know, in public culture, they're, they're, their personness, uh, their private life, erased. Very little known about them. Um, and even if you look at some of the biographies of these women, um, a lot of it is um, mediated through the biographers. You know, whether it's Baker's own children, um, so it's, it's or you know, um, anyone's agent. Um, so it's it's very it's very it's impossible. It's impossible to actually know these people as real people. So I don't try to pretend to do so. Um, and also. Jumping off, talking about those two figures, and also your um, other writing, like on Crazy Rich Asians and all these pop cultural figures, it struck me that you are incredibly empathetic to these even problematic representations, which um, was very humbling to me at a time when a lot of people are criticizing like those representations for obvious reasons. Um, like you're almost empathizing with the quote unquote bad guy. And um, mm. I think that's really interesting on what makes you decide to do that. I mean, they're, given there's so yeah. much backlash. Well, actually, there's two different. I, I don't feel it as empathy. I, um, I don't experience it as a kind of empathy. Um, I experience it as. So there's two actually, there's like two slightly different answers to that question. The first answer is. Um, When I, so for both Josephine Baker and Anna Mae Wong, I came to their work pretty late in my life. And it's partially because I've always heard about Anna Mae Wong, and I've heard about Josephine Baker, and everything I hear about these figures just makes me cringe. You know, I, 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 I say to myself, I thought to myself, why in the world do we want to see another exoticization of Asian women on the big screen? Why in the world would I want to go see someone like Josephine Baker doing her primitive, you know, monkey dance? Why would you know, like I was just not, you know, there was a kind of but I think that's but what I've learned is related to what I said earlier about how stereotyping something or recognizing something as stereotype has actually in fact prevented us from looking at certain things. Because when I actually went and looked at this is the first time I saw a film by Josephine Baker it was Princess Tam Tam and um, and for Anna Mae Wong it was um, um, oh, what was the movie that I saw? I guess it was uh, Shape of Piccadilly. Um, it was re-digitalized and shown at the Castro in San Francisco. Um, and I, so the thing that struck me was when I saw these films was that these figures were nothing like the way they were described. Right? So everyone said, you know, Josephine Baker, she's, she's a primitive, she just catered to primitivism, she just catered to you know, European desire for savagery. And then when I you know, and she uses a, a, her nakedness in that way. And then when I saw the film, what I saw was a really complicated negotiation with her skin. And in fact, there is a very famous scene in Princess Tam Tam that, if you even look it up, it's online. Everyone talks about the scene where she strips. But when you see the movie, she had, she does strip, but she doesn't get naked. She has a full length gown underneath another gown. And it was just, and that was like, whoa, I just blew my mind. I thought, how is it that this person could actually have not stripped and not gone even half naked, and yet everyone thought she did? And it just sort of pointed out to me how fantasmatic people's concept of racialized exposure really is. Um, and the same thing with Anna Mae Wong. I thought, oh, it's going to be some horrible, like, you know, exoticization of the Chinese woman in American cinema, blah, blah. But you know, when I saw um, Piccadilly, I thought, wow, she was extremely withholding. Like everyone talked about what a, what a, um, what a, like a sex kitten she was in the 
but she was actually really cool, right? Um, and, uh, and again, in another scene where she was supposed to be dancing in a kind of, you know, um, um, semi um, burlesque way, she was wearing a costume that had giant spikes, like really harsh, right? Um, and so again, you know, all these pieces make me think, um, so it's not like I'm empathetic to the, the it's I actually don't think they were doing what people thought they were doing. I mean, clearly, like as in all popular culture, it's partially this and partially that. And of course there are stereotypes, you know, and certainly the people who made these films wanted to stereotype and exploit these women. But their actual performance as work, as labor, um, as artistic engagement says so much more than the boundary that's being placed on them. So it's not like I'm empathetic to the bad stuff, it's like I think there's so much more than the bad stuff going on. And if we, all we do is look at the bad stuff, we're actually being really reductive ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one answer. Um, the crazy rich agent is a slightly different um, kind of question um, because so, you know, by the time I was asked to write a review for the Los Angeles Review of Books, and by the time I was writing it, there were already other reviews out, and they were all basically two kinds. Those who loved it, because it represented Asianness, no matter what cost, <laughs> and, those who, <laughs> and those who hated it, because they just could not, they just thought it was just a horrible um, stereotype. Um, and so my first, job is all that I might I just thought it's not my job to repeat that binary, you know. Um, and I wanted to write something that can accommodate the complication of my own feelings about the film, which is on the one hand, it is all those horrible stuff that people thought. Um, that, you know, it is basically, you know, the the neoliberalism of the modern minority discourse, right? Um, and it's all those things that you think that people have pointed out. But also thought there was something about, for me, in New Jersey, going to a movie theater to see this movie, it was, I went into a particularly large theater in, in Hamilton, New Jersey. It seats about like 150 people, 200, it's one of the big theaters. It was packed. Every single seat. We had to sit at the second row because it was so packed. <laughs> and it was all Asian faces. And I just thought, wow. I mean, there. There was something so wonderful for me to be in that audience um, with all these Asian looking faces, whether or not they're real Asians, or oh, I have no idea, right? But to, to, to sort of see this imagined community for two hours in the theater, it, it was not something I was willing to dismiss and say, you know, I was not willing to just to say, all oh, these people are blindly looking for images of themselves on the screen. I think there was something real about what it means to be a community that is not often, doesn't experience itself like a community. The importance of the ability to come together as a community on whatever tenuous grounds for however brief a time. So I wanted to honor that. Um, so for the Crazy Rich Asian, it was a slightly different, um, but I'm always uncomfortable with binary positions because I think that, that leaves out something much more complicated and interesting in between. Well, that leads me to my next question because I think in curating this show, actually what sparked my interest in this topic about AGI femininity and artificiality was techno-orientalism, which um, a, that was the primary lens in which people who were making work about that took. Is like, And then all these questions emerged because people were like, Am I embodying a stereotype? Am I being a techno-orientalist, even though I'm Asian? You know, so that's the trouble with binaries. And I remember talking with you once, and you said, like, oh, techno-orientalism is nothing new. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was so struck because that was the so foundation of what I was interested in. So I'm interested in how you think, I mean, how you came to that conclusion and what are your thoughts on that. Well, so, um, so, so I, I think techno, so I, when I first heard the term techno orientalism, I was very excited because I thought, oh, we're actually thinking about orientalism in a different way, which was really exciting for me. And then I started reading about it, and it seems like a lot of people who write about techno orientalism basically um, is rehearsing an orientalist critique, except in the realm of technology. 
Um, and so that was a bit disappointing to me. And that's why I'm about like not being new, uh, because it's actually um, just rehearsing Orientalism, but in the realm of technology. And so, what I, so I think there are two problems with that, or there are two, um, two limitations to that that I think one could think more about. Um, so the first thing is, I am really interested in the relationship between Asiaticness and technology, not simply as a kind of trope or alibi. Right? So a lot of people who write about techno-orientalism, for example, a typical techno-orientalist argument would be something like, in the Blade Runner, Asia is used as a trope to represent futurity. So that's why you guys remember Blade Runner, that you look like you could be in Tokyo, right? Except there's no Asian, very, very few Asian people in this in Tokyo. <laughs> but anyway, um, so that's the kind of argument one would make. But I am actually so much, I'm really interested in in that relationship, um, because it has some, so like, so I think Asianness and Asiatic, um, and the Asiatic, does not only serve as a backdrop or as an alibi for science fiction. I think it actually offers a kind of engine for this fantasy about synthetic life in the first place. So I'm interested in a much more intimate relationship between Asi Asianness and technology, other than technology barring the face of Asia, you know, uh, as a kind of appropriation. So that's the first limitation, is that if we keep thinking about Asian tropes as mere backdrops to these Western films, then we're actually missing a much more important work that the Asiatic presence is doing in these films. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing is I think a lot of the conversations around techno-orientalism tend to be really presentist, right? So it attributes this whole fantasy about Asian futurity to, Asia, to the, Asia, the modernization of Asia, in particular Japan, right? And its technological advance. So, you know, 20th century, basically. But I think techno-orientalism, the techne of Asiatic, of Asianness, goes all the way back much earlier um, to 18th and 19th century. Um, and so, um, so that I think the, the idea of Asiatic artificiality is much older than just the invention of you know, technology as we think of it in the 21st century. That actually has always been a kind of technique and craft around the construction of Asianness that has been um, it's a much longer history than techno-orientalism usually account for. Um, and similarly, I, um, I mean, another way to think about this is that in techno-orientalism, it sounds like, well, there's this old orientalism where the orient is made regressive and so forth. And then suddenly, we get the new techno-orientalism where everything is technological. I actually think these two things are not separate. I think that the image of the geisha and the image of the cyborg are actually not opposite with the same, that they came out of the same kind of um, making thingliness of Asiatic femininity. Um, so, so yeah, so that's my, I, I like the term. I wish people would use it to do more than what they have. Um, oh, so techno orientalism? Yeah. Or ornamental. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Techno orientalism, yeah. Um, yeah, I liked your uh, description of Asiatic presence in Ex Machina because there's a crucial scene um, where the white Caucasian cyborg is peeling off the skin of the Asian cyborg and placing on her body in order to be actually a pretty contemporary woman despite being futuristic cyborg. Yeah. So, um, but then you talked about how there is Asian cyborgs in this movie, but also the black cyborg and it happens so quickly, and but there, you talk about how their skin actually looks comparatively more real, or mm -hmm. has that more fleshiness, and that goes back to the Venus Hottentot. Mm -hmm. that you yeah, the, the, I mean, how many of you have seen Ex Machina? It, it's kind of a hard movie to watch, right? Because it's so incredibly sexist and racist. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, oh my god, like, is this going to be over soon? <laughs> I mean, but I write about it because I thought it was such a great dramatization of the complexity around this question of um, Asiatic community, um, artificial life, um, and uh, you know appropriation. So that scene you're talking about, where um, Alicia Vikander, I guess, is the actress, um, plays um, Eva, 
um, the a, a cyborg. And so at the end of the movie, she she basically kills her creator slash master, um, and she's escaping, and she takes a she takes the skin from a previous. And so apparently the guy has been the, the this genius, who's um, the the mastermind behind all this, um, is interested in developing the next stage of human evolution, like the greatest AI in the world. And of course, being a ridiculous plot that it was, we were all disappointed <laughs> to find out, in fact, he was just making sex toys for himself. <laughs> so, okay, there, that's a little disappointing. But anyway, but the thing to notice about that um, is that all of the, almost all of the models that he made that were based on his own porn profile, basically, were women of color. In fact, all, almost all, women who look like they're Asian, right? So they're Asian AIs, um, androids. Um, and the, the, the one white android, man, which is the main character, um, is made after another character in the movie's home profile. So it's actually not his, whatever, erotic dream. But anyway, so this, at the end, she takes the skin from a previous, a previous model, the previous model herself, right? She's like 3.0 and this is like 2.9 or whatever. And she, and, um, and she feels that on. And everyone's, you know, it's on the one hand, it's very clearly a, a, a moment of um, of uh, weird reverse yellow face. Um, it's a moment of appropriation where Asiatic femininity is being borrowed. Um, but it's interesting. But what's interesting is that that thing is being that that, that, that yellowness is being borrowed to make the character or her um, Eva more human-like. Right, so it's actually through this racialized otherness that she becomes more of a person. Um, and so it brings up all these questions, and this is something I trace on complicated in other films, like Ghost in the Shell, for example, where actually, so what, what I think is really important to think about is um, how these acts of appropriation are bad, you know, because they're appropriation, but they also say something about the engine of racial otherness in Western self-constitution, right? And this is actually also a parable of how, how white personhood comes to constitute itself by person, as a being a person, organic person, pretend or any person, by borrowing this yellow skin. Um, and so, um, but the other thing about the black figure was that um, the, the, the person who invents all these robots is clearly um, Kind of a, has has a, has an Asian fetish, right? As we say, because he makes all, his, all the models um, Asian looking. But we do see, and actually, um, we were talking about a mutual friend of ours, Cynthia Harpin, who's a wonderful scholar at Columbia. When when she when we first talked about this movie, she said, "I know, and it's not even a single black woman in the movie." And I said, "Actually, there was, for like two seconds, literally. They were seeing there were two black androids discarded in the corner of a room." Um, and um, it was so quick that even my friend didn't see it. Right? Even someone who was looking for the black body couldn't find the black body. And, um, and I thought it was a very telling moment, uh, not only about this guy's particular erotic you know, fetish, et cetera, but it was also something about how in those, if you, thanks to the magic of video tape, you can stop the frame and look at it. Um, but the black figures are, unlike all the other androids who looked very much like an android because they were Asian, so they were all slim and boy like, very modelly looking, willowy, right? Um, and something, somehow their slimness is completely feeds into our whole modernist aesthetic around streamlinedness and cleanliness and so forth, right? Whereas the black um, models that he created were um, like real women. They, they had flesh, you know, they had a kind of weightiness. And, then, and so the skin looked more real because they actually looked like they were real women. Um, but they were discarded, I think, not only because they were black, but also because they were actually too much like real women. You know? um, and so this, this, again, this is a, takes us back to ornamentalism. Like, how is it that the Asiatic female body lends itself so well to being a robot? You know, mm -hmm. to being a thing, and not just a thing, but also a robot or a modernist object without, um, you know, with a certain kind of streamlining um, spareness, right? Well, it's interesting to me because there are so many examples of things that we have rage at, like ex machina and racist um, representation. But you emphasize that ornamentalism isn't a critique, it is a theory of being. And I'm curious as to 
where you make that distinction um, and how it has it bears relevance to people who do find themselves through these attachments and prosthetics and adornments. And so I, I think that the reason I say that it's um, it, it's I think ornamentalism does include a, a critical component to it, um, unavoidably. And in that way, it is um, hopefully a kind of um, can speak alongside a critique of or, uh, Orientalism. But I think that the reason why I say that, I like to think about it not as only a critique, but as a, a theory of being, is because I'm trying to find space for thinking about alternative modes of personhood, alternative modes of ontology, of survival, of alternative modes of existence for those who have been denied person, legal personhood um, or other forms of social recognition. Um, and so, um, so I, I don't want to just be pointing fingers and wagging my fingers at um, Oriental, um, at, at ornamental this sort of um, uh, projections, but I want to sort of think about how, um, like what, you know, we all know it's, yeah, so it's terrible to be turned into an object, but let's say you have for centuries. <laughs> Now what, right? Like, well, how? What is produced out of that? Um, and what's being produced out of that is a great deal of objection, but also alternative modes of survival. You know, and, and again, thinking about someone like Anna May Wong, Josephine Baker. Yes, they were objectified. Yes, they were um, exoticized in various ways. But this does not mean they haven't found ways of working within those conditions. You know, there's a great moment in um, Piccadilly where Anna May Wong, the character. Um, she signs a contract for it to be a, to be a performer in a nightclub, and um, and instead of signing her character's name, Anna May Wong signs her own name on the contract, and in Chinese, which is an extraordinary moment. Now, first of all, like most people don't know that because they don't read Chinese and they're not looking, right? But um, not only does she not sign the name of her character. She breaks out of her character to sign her own name at that moment, and she signs her Chinese name. Um, so there was something about, um, so that's a moment where, it's a moment where the ornament, ornament itself in ways that the ornamentalist did not intend, right? She is decorating that paper with her own name, and in a, in a way that very few people can recognize or understand. Um, and it's not just her asserting authenticity. It's not just authenticity, because what she's saying is um, um, her stage name, Anna May Wong. Um, and so, you know, it, it made me think of that wonderful line by Rita Hayward who's, that said, you know, everyone loves Rita Hayward, but they wake up with, um, oh no, no, I'm sorry, everyone likes Rita, uh, no, Gilda. Everyone loves Gilda, but they wake up with Rita Hayward. There's something about, so I thought that signature was the moment where she, ex exceeds her own objectness, but not by asserting her subjectness in, in an easy way, but actually by asserting another representation of her, of her real subjectness, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's what I mean by like, thinking about ornamentalism, not only as a condition of coercion, but also given that coercion, thinking about what else can emerge in spite of that coercion or alongside of it. Mm -hmm. um, well, that brings me to um, my desire to talk more about this show, because that I think the artists that I assembled are dealing with that question, like, okay, this history has been imposed on us, um, now what do we do? But in selecting the objects for the show, I was very careful to understand what's a criticism versus what is absolutely decrying ornamental being, and um, I think that's really interesting, um, because I think a lot of people, well, take for instance, Tiffany's work, where the milk is dripping onto the porcelain plate, mm -hmm. is it in the process of healing and regeneration? And what will that plate look like if the magic were to work? You know, and um, so I guess my question is, what have you observed to be responses to that? The the crit critical because I think resisting is kind of a, like a limiting and broad term, but. I want to just understand what is going on now that we realize that this is happening. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think anything is wrong with decrying a, 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 a problematic representation. I just don't want to stop there. 
right? I don't want the decline to be an ex um, to prevent us from thinking more about what's actually happening. Um, so I am really grateful to um, several, I mean, in fact, all the artists in the show in trying to help, you know, in helping me think through and about this question of ornamentalism in different directions. And I think that, you know, all the works in here are incredibly different, but they all share one thing, which is I think they're all trying to think through this question of the conjunction, the meeting place of um, Asiatic personhood, race, gender, and thingliness. Um, and so um, Tiffany's piece is really, so that is the piece on the, on the left there, um, is super interesting. Um, uh, well, in, in this, so to sort of answer your question about that, I think that that piece in thinking about, um, so the porcelain invokes a whole history of um, not just porcelain as object, but also its intimate relationship to um, to Asiatic femininity, um, the the ways in which Asian skin had been confused with porcelain. For example, how many of you have ever seen Nancy Kwan hawking pearl cream in the middle of the night? How many of you have seen Sami <laughs> What in the, in the in the 1980s? And um, and you was a part of that. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Right, who's from Flower Town Song and um, oh, the also, biracial. Yeah, and also from um, the world of Susie Wong. Mm -hmm. So she, she's, you know, between anime, see, I would say anime one and Nancy Kwan, the other two Asian American actresses uh, out of old Hollywood that we all know about, right? Um, but anyway, but in her later life, she, um, in her later life incarnation, <coughs> she was selling this thing called Pearl Cream on TV. And, it, you know, she basically say things like, I don't remember the exact phrase of the, of the pitch, but something like, you know, if you want pearl skin, porcelain skin like mine, use pearl cream, you know. Oh, I know, there was something about the beginning, something like, you know, for thousands of years, Asian women had no skin. <laughs> 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 oh, pearl cream. Um, and um, so this is long, so I, I think the plate underneath the, uh, in Tiffany's piece, refers to not only history of um, commodity and its value to the U.S., I would say porcelain is the first object of, um, one of the first objects of international trade, and um, the object of most value, they, they call it a white gold, right? This is before Europe could reproduce porcelain the way China could, uh, could produce, they couldn't produce it at first for, me, for, for many years, and so porcelain was very much value. Um, so it refers to that history, but it also refers to the skin, you know, um, Asian women. And, and Tiffany and I have been talking about how lactic acid, which is produced out of fermentation, um, has been used in cosmetics today. Like if you go to the makeup counter today, a lot of stuff had lactic acid in them. Um, and that's supposed to like be good for your skin. And so if you think about like the milk dripping as both, um, um, it, it, to me it's very evocative, right? It, it evokes this question of could it, could it heal the porcelain or skin or the history of racial objection? Or is it actually a perpetual erosion? Right, um, it, the, the dripping reminds me of water torture, um, for example. So it's very evocative on all these different levels, and um, so so I think what is interesting to me about that piece in particular is the way it's able to sustain this simultaneous possibility of something being promising, cured, and also doing damaging at this, doing damage at the same time, and if that balance rather than choosing like one or the other. That's, I think, is the power of that piece. And it's the same thing here with Tania's um, crochet. Um, you know, it's, it's such an amazing balance of um, delicateness, you know, with the crochet, but also brutality, um, being hung up on link hooks, um, the intimacy of domesticity and violence. Um, so it's all, so I think, and this is of course why I think I love about and appreciate about art in general is that it raises these possibilities and oftentimes contradictory possibilities and insists that we entertain them at the same time. This is what Keats the poet called negative capability, the ability to entertain opposing ideas at the same time. Um, so I think that, yeah, I mean, and, and of course, Can Candace's piece, which I feel incredibly terrible sitting in front of, blocking <laughs> <Sorry. everyone>. our <laughs> altar. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, and, and this, you know, is a, a wonderful piece evoking um, the relationship between 
porcelain, unfinished porcelain, and it's it's um, the, sort of it's aging over time. And she, you know, it's I, I don't want to go on and on about it, but it, but it brings in these issues of colonial history. Um, it's just really fascinating. I actually thought I knew everything about porcelain until I read Ken Candice's book. Yeah, <laughs> more to learn. So well, talking see. about how like a Asian flesh as techne extending all the way back to 18th centuries, she found um, scholarship that European merchants described it as a hard white body, mm -hmm. and so already you have the racialization of inanimate or supposedly neutral objects and trying to bring it to life. Well, it's weird because um, the whiteness of porcelain is so deeply polluted in so many ways, right? Um, polluted in the first place by being the fact that it is actually for a long time, it was definitely a Chinese object. You know, um, it's you know Europeans imported it because it was Chinese. Um, nobody wanted porcelain from Europe because they were not making the same quality. And the way they talked about porcelain um, in the beginning was incredibly. Um, there's a lot of personification behind it. You know, it's known as this thing that is very fragile and delicate, but it can withstand tremendous amount of heat. So it's hard and soft, it's warm and cool, it's, you know, it's fragile and durable. So, and all these terms start to sort of like, start to sound like, and the word, as in fact, gets sort of displaced onto Asian bodies, right? Um, and so the, the phrase, the hard white body, there is a ghost within that ghost, and that's yellowness, you know, because, um, I mean, Ken, 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 Candace talks about this in her work, that um, Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, used because it's so fine, um, the, por the pores are so fine, used it to make the first Pasteur uh, funnel, and they used it to um, um, uh, purify water, because you will trap all the bacteria in, in it, because the, the pores of the pores are so fine. But, when things start going, when bacteria start going through that are so small, that's the beginning. That's when they discover all these things around, you know, um, like vi viruses. Um, and so, even within that scientific history, there's just the portion of that funnel says so much about how yellowness is used to, um, uh, as a kind of sieve to weed out. Yieldness, but it's itself producing at the sign of yieldness, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, there's just a lot of amazing, complicated history on porcelain. We never thought it's such a, you know, um, and it's also worth thinking about why is um, porcelain today degraded so much, right? I mean, why is the trope of the mean boss, which is this incredibly valuable thing, a, a, a hackney? thing now is such a, you know, it's a tchotchka, right? So there's something about the, the devaluation of porcelain from white gold to tchotchka that I think says something actually about, um, one, the economic, the economic relation between America and Europe and China, and two, says something about, so it's partially economic, but it's also partially about a kind of, the same, it's the same process that turned celestial beings into the yellow peril, right? And, um, so, yeah, I'm going to stop there. Oh, <laughs> my history lesson's not there, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Anne did not believe that we could fill two hours, but um, I have to stop so we have um, time for questions. Um, so think about what you want to ask. I just wanted to raise the community guidelines, which I hope that everyone will be respectful since we're talking about sensitive subjects to center um, friends of color and don't be afraid to be wrong, this is a safe space, be open to the possibility. Um, if you have a question that's more like a comment, um, you don't have to say that, just, <laughs> just bring it on. <laughs> so um, who has a who wants to break the ice? Who has the first question? Um, hi, my name is Janice. I saw you speak at Yale three years ago oh. when this book was in its really early stages. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm wondering if you can just talk about how it's changed from then to now, maybe, and if the process of writing and publishing it has made you rethink some of the early formations you put out, or if that's mostly been consistent over time. Well, um, well I think that um, 
Actually, by the time I gave that yell, oh, mm -hmm. that was slowly cold, closing out of it. Um, you know, these books, I, there are many of you who write books in here, you know this, but it takes like a year for a book to come out. So for me, even though this book came out this January, it feels like it's older <laughs> than that. Um, but, um, but I think what I've been thinking, I, I think that I, um, I've been writing about this topic for a really long time. It took me like 10 years to write this book. But it wasn't until the last, I would say, three or four years that I really figured out what I was trying to do. Um, and so, I mean, most of those of you who write will know this is not something unusual, but I feel like I'm like walking in a circle, slowly, slowly, circling in you know, on the thing, and near the end, I get there. And then it's like a big rush. So the last couple of years of me finishing the book, it was like kind of like me just, you know, um, it was like I finally, oh, I finally, I saw the house, you know, I knew all these different parts, but I couldn't see the whole house. So, um, so I think what, I, I don't think I changed my mind about that um, at all, but I had, I had been thinking about my next project. And so I, I'm also really interested in food studies and in um, animal studies. And so in, um, in the book, there's a chapter about sushi, so you can sort of see the beginning of me moving towards food. But actually, I'm writing a piece now on the idea of swarming um, as a kind of transition from this project, because I think swarming is a kind of ornamentalism. It's excessive profusion of details, but around insects and around people and around food. Um, and so um, that's sort of direction I'm moving in. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, take me. Um, I wanted to ask a lot of the way you write about ornamentalism. You talk about the synthetic, the aesthetic theory, and like how it, all of the theories kind of reside on the surface. I wonder how ornamentalism could offer ways to think about like structural critiques, like that, or if aesthetic theory um, doesn't maybe lend itself to that. I mean, just like maybe access to like Well, I, have that. I actually might just make my colleague now that I want to be who is a who's bringing about economics. So, um, so, so yeah, I think it does. It could. Um, and it's because I think my use of the surface is not about um, my view of surface is not that it is an opposition to depth. Right. Um, I think one of, in the recent years, one of my frustration is that um, people keep lumping me into surface reading, which is a reading sort of critical trend in, academ in academics recently. Um, and it's true I'm really interested in surfaces, but I'm actually interested in, in precisely the surface, not as something separate from interiority, not as something that hides interiority, but something that is actually in profound engagement with interiority, right? So that it's actually both surface and structure at the same time. Um, so, um, so I just want to first by saying that surface for me is not in opposition to interiority. Surface for me is a complicated implication with interiority. Um, uh, and so I'm always trying to tease out those connections. Uh, but um, I'm trying to think about a good example of sort of a structural. Um, now, you think about porcelain, for example. Um, so in writing about porcelain in, 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 I think, chapter three or four in my book, um, I was talking about the uses of porcelain in a show at the Met called China Through the Looking Glass, which many of you have probably seen. Um, and there's actually a whole area that's devoted to kind of the, the blue willow theme, the, the blue and white porcelain. Um, and in thinking about those, um, pieces and we talk about porcelain, I think it was very important to think about porcelain as an economic um, as an economic enterprise, but also as a weirdly epidermal, racial epidermal enterprise at the same time, um, and also as a kind of material engagement. And so I don't know if I'm answering the question very well, but um, I'm trying to think in the book, what would be an example of the structure? Um, well, you talk about um, how it has legal implications as oh, well. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, because we're talking about um, the imaginary woman, we're talking about inauthentic representation, but 
ultimately what you are saying is this has does have implications for the real woman and um, who gets excluded. You know, I read all these interviews of Angel Island, which um, is infamously. Oh, yeah, they would, I remember the little quote. They, yeah, yeah, they would yeah, question yeah. you, like, you know, how many steps lead to your neighbor's door, and if you don't um, answer at, at the same as your father, then you get sent back. I mean, it has real world implications, and some of the questions that they ask are like, you know, what kind of ornaments are you wearing? Did your husband give them to you? Um, so. Yeah, I, I, that was one of the things that actually drove me in my essay, mm -hmm. is to actually prove that these things have such real-world implications. I mean, I talked about the gentrification of Chinatown, for example. There was a recent incident where an artist, um, a very unimportant artist, <laughs> <laughs> um, appropriated a lot of Chinatown aesthetics for his like architectural installation. And it was very interesting to me that the only defense that we have against this person was that the person is white, or um, you know, uh, the gallery is white, the business is white, and they have no authority to use Asian aesthetics. This is an inauthentic person. And getting back to your thing about stereotypes. Um, but then I was I joined the protest. There were so many protests, and um, it really struck me that there was um, a couple of people, some non, uh, gender non-binary, some women, who started eating durian in the middle of the protest. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, obviously that's so funny because I recognize what she's trying to do. She's trying to make it stinky. She's ready to <laughs> throw chicken liver back there. And um, But she is performing a negative stereotype to fight another <laughs> negative stereotype. But um, so I think part of the immense relief for me was finding ornamentalism and realizing that actually she's recognizing her flesh everywhere, displayed everywhere, and trying to reunify it, make it more perishable, less, less abused by someone who is using it so um, violently. Yeah. No, I, mean, I think that the point that, I mean, one of the major points that I hope it will be clear is that um, these things, these things that we think of as so um, superficial and feminine, like ornaments, have profound, have been profoundly um, influential in how we think about persons and non-persons. And the and, and thank you for reminding me of my first chapter, which I she knows my book better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I but yeah, you know, I, 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 wrote, I wrote about this really um, amazing case. Um, um, in um, 1876, where um, where it's a it's the first time Chinese litigants ever appeared before the U.S. Supreme Court. It was a case um, called China versus China v. Freeman, but it was commonly known back then as the case of the 22 lewd Chinese women. And um, you know, it's a case about um, big issue, which is U.S. Um, government, state versus. Um, um, government's control over immigration, right? So super serious stuff. And the case turned, like literally turned, on this question of women's ornaments. And, and so a, a quick, a quickie thing, I mean, quickie summary, is that basically 22 women arrived on a ship with like 300 um, um, travelers, port of San Francisco, and the, the 22 women were not allowed off the boat because they were unaccompanied by men. And the reason is, and, and they, uh, the immigration officer said that they were, they were, he just said they were prostitutes, they were lewd prostitutes, even though there's no evidence for it. Um, and these went to court and there's a whole interesting legal, um, whole long history around that. But what's amazing is um, what it came down to on a legal level is that whether or not California has the right to, um, to turn away these women when they had papers and they had the Burning Game Treaty behind them and they had, you know, so, so the U.S. says yes, they could come and California says they can't, so this is the state versus, you know, it's like a huge, this very important struggle. And if you look at the transcript, which you can get on Amazon.com, by the way, um, <laughs> the whole transcript, it's amazing. I'll, I'll buy one copy and send you a PDF. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no Amazon money. <laughs> It is amazing. The entire thing, I mean, like, I would say like three quarters of the 
examination centered around what the women were wearing. Mm -hmm. So imagine this, 1876, bunch of white, pretty old male lawyers interrogating 22 young, 16 to 18 years old women about what kind of hairstyle, you know, are you, you know, are you wearing something? Are you wearing yellow silk under your black? I mean, it just went on and on. And, it was, and the reason why they were doing that was because the whole question was whether or not these women were lewd, right? Um, and what is a sign of lewdness? The things that they're wearing. And it, it becomes even weirder than that because it turns out, you know, um, the other thing that they, the only thing that could have saved these women, that if they were to be respectable wives, um, but then respect the wife in Chinatown also wear the same kind of, and so you get these men debating about, well, is this sleeve wide enough to be lewd <laughs> versus proper? And it's just an amazing dog and pony show. I mean, just incredible. But you, but you actually see that, in fact, this whole question about whether or not these women have the right, I mean, they were not citizens, so this is way before you know, that's even a question. The question about whether or not they were, have the right to a basic trial to have a right to get off a boat, basic human rights, right? But their humanity and their, therefore their legal personhood was all predicated on the question of ornaments and what kind of ornaments were being used. So, um, you know, if nothing else, I, I want to point out that this very, on the one hand, the superficial category, minor category of ornaments, and on the other hand, the superficial category of Asian women are actually far from superficial and in fact even structural to how the U.S. think about persons, both legally but also culturally and imaginatively. Thank you. Um, well, we want to wrap this up um, soon because I want to have people have a chance to see the show and um, Anne will be for here for a little bit yeah. to answer questions and get your celebrity pictures taken. <laughs>